on may ninth seventeen fifty three in a letter written by pennsylvania's most famous resident to peter collinson fellow of the royal society in london benjamin franklin gave full vent to his frustration on the topics of welfare and immigration in the american colonies this is one of franklin's most important letters now available through the national archives and online at founders.archives.gov in it are discussed welfare relief and its psychological effects on recipients and the difficulties of assimilation of german immigrants into colonial america while at least five versions of this letter exist, this copy from the Hardwick Papers in the New York Public Library is considered the fullest surviving version. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in November 2016. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer on the LibriVox project, please visit LibriVox.org. Philadelphia, May ninth, 1753. To Peter Collinson. Sir, I received your favor of the 29th August last, and thank you for the kind and judicious remarks you have made on my little piece, Observations on the Increase of Mankind. Whatever further occurs to you on the same subject, you will much oblige me in communicating it. I have often observed with wonder that temper of the poor English manufacturers and day laborers which you mention, and acknowledge it to be pretty general. When any of them happen to come here, where labor is much better paid than in England, their industry seems to diminish in equal proportion. But it is not so with the German laborers. They retain the habitual industry and frugality they bring with them, and now receiving higher wages, an accumulation arises that makes them all rich. When I consider that the English are the offspring of Germans, that the climate they live in is much of the same temperature, when I can see nothing in nature that should create this difference, I am apt to suspect it must arise from institution and I have sometimes doubted whether the laws peculiar to England, which compel the rich to maintain the poor, have not given the latter a dependence that very much lessens the care of providing against the wants of old age. I have heard it remarked that the poor in Protestant countries on the continent of Europe are generally more industrious than those of popish countries, May not the more numerous foundations in the latter for the relief of the poor have some effect towards rendering them less provident? To relieve the misfortunes of our fellow creatures is concurring with the deity, tis godlike. But if we provide encouragements for laziness and supports for folly, may it not be found fighting against the order of God and nature, which perhaps has appointed want and misery as the proper punishments for, and cautions against, as well as necessary consequences of, idleness and extravagancy? When we attempt to mend the scheme of providence and to interfere in the government of the world, we had need be very circumspect, lest we do more harm than good. In New England, they once thought blackbirds useless and mischievous to their corn. They made laws to destroy them. The consequence was the blackbirds were diminished, but the kind of worms which devoured their grass and which the blackbirds had been used to feed on increased prodigiously. Then, finding their loss in grass much greater than their saving in corn, they wished again for their blackbirds. We had here some years since a Transylvanian Tartar, Samuel Domine, a Romanian priest, who had traveled much in the east, and came hither merely to see the west, intending to go home through the Spanish West Indies, China, and etc., he asked me one day what I thought might be the reason that so many and such numerous nations as the Tartars in Europe and Asia, the Indians in America, and the Negroes in Africa continued a wandering, careless life and refused to live in cities and to cultivate the arts they saw practiced by the civilized part of mankind. While I was considering what answer to make him, I'll tell you, says he in his broken English, God make man for paradise. He make him for to live lazy. Man make God angry. God turn him out of paradise and bid him work. Man no love work. 
he want to go to paradise again he want to live lazy so all mankind love lazy however it may be it seems certain that the hope of becoming at some time of life free from the necessity of care and labor together with fear of penury are the mainsprings of most people's industry to those indeed who have been educated in elegant plenty even the provision made for the poor may appear misery but to those who have scarce ever been better provided for such provision may seem quite good and sufficient these latter have then nothing to fear worse than their present conditions and scarce hope for anything better than a parish maintenance so that there is only the difficulty of getting that maintenance allowed while they are able to work or a little shame they suppose attending it that can induce them to work at all and what they do will only be from hand to mouth the proneness of human nature to a life of ease of freedom from care and labor appears strongly in the little success that has hitherto attended every attempt to civilize our american indians in their present way of living almost all their wants are supplied by the spontaneous productions of nature with the addition of very little labor if hunting and fishing may indeed be called labor when game is so plenty they visit us frequently and see the advantages that arts sciences and compact society procure us they are not deficient in natural understanding and yet they have never shown any inclination to change their manner of life for ours or to learn any of our arts when an indian child has been brought up among us taught our language and habituated to our customs yet if he goes to see his relations and make one indian ramble with them there is no persuading him ever to return and that this is not natural to them merely as indians but as men is plain from this that when white persons of either sex have been taken prisoners young by the indians and lived a while among them though ransomed by their friends and treated with all imaginable tenderness to prevail with them to stay among the english yet in a short time they become disgusted with our manner of life and the care and pains that are necessary to support it and take the first good opportunity of escaping again into the woods from whence there is no reclaiming them one instance i remember to have heard where the person was brought home to possess a good estate but finding some care necessary to keep it together he relinquished it to a younger brother reserving to himself nothing but a gun and a match coat with which he took his way again into the wilderness though they have few but natural wants and those easily supplied with us are infinite artificial wants no less craving than those of nature and much more difficult to satisfy so that i am apt to imagine that close societies subsisting by labor and arts arose first not from choice but from necessity when numbers being driven by war from their hunting grounds and prevented by seas or by other nations were crowded together into some narrow territories which without labor would not afford them food however as matters now stand with us care and industry seem absolutely necessary to our well-being they should therefore have every encouragement we can invent and not one motive to diligence be subtracted and the support of the poor should not be maintaining them in idleness but by employing them in some kind of labor suited to their abilities of body and etc as i am informed of late begins to be the practice in many parts of england where workhouses are erected for that purpose if these were general i should think the poor would be more careful and work voluntarily and lay up something for themselves against a rainy day rather than run the risk of being obliged to work at the pleasure of others for a bare subsistence and that too under confinement the little value indians set on what we prize so highly under the name of learning appears from a pleasant passage that happened some years since at a treaty between one of our colonies and the six nations when everything had been settled to the satisfaction of both sides and nothing remained but a mutual exchange of civilities the english commissioners told the indians that they had in their country a college for the instruction of youth who were there taught various languages arts and sciences that there was a particular foundation in favor of the indians to defray the expense of the education of any of their sons who should desire to take the benefit of it 
and now if the indians would accept the offer the english would take half a dozen of their brightest lads and bring them up in the best manner the indians after consulting on the proposal replied that it was remembered some of their youths had formerly been educated in that college but it had been observed that for a long time after they returned to their friends they were absolutely good for nothing being neither acquainted with the true methods of killing deer catching beaver or surprising an enemy the proposition however they looked on as a mark of the kindness and good will of the english to the indian nations which merited a grateful return and therefore if the english gentlemen would send a dozen or two of their children to onondago the great council would take care of their education bring them up in really what was the best manner and make men of them i am perfectly of your mind that measures of great temper are necessary with the germans and am not without apprehensions that through their indiscretion or ours or both great disorders and inconveniences may one day arise among us those who come hither are generally of the most ignorant stupid sort of their own nation and as ignorance is often attended with credulity when knavery would mislead it and with suspicion when honesty would set it right and as few of the english understand the german language and so cannot address them either from the press or the pulpit it is almost impossible to remove any prejudices they once entertain their own clergy have very little influence over the people who seem to take an uncommon pleasure in abusing and discharging the minister on every trivial occasion not being used to liberty they know not how to make a modest use of it and as colbin says of the young hottentots in his the present state of the cape of good hope that they are not esteemed men till they have shown their manhood by beating their mothers so these seem to think themselves not free till they can feel their liberty in abusing and insulting their teachers thus they are under no restraint of ecclesiastical government they behave however submissively enough at present to the civil government which i wish they may continue to do for i remember when they modestly declined intermeddling in our elections but now they come in droves and carry all before them except in one or two counties few of their children in the country learn english they import many books from germany and of the six printing houses in the province two are entirely german two half german half english and but two entirely english they have one german newspaper and one half german advertisements intended to be general are now printed in dutch and english the signs in our streets have inscriptions in both languages and in some places only german they begin of late to make all their bonds and other legal writings in their own language which though i think it ought not to be are allowed good in our courts where the german business so increases that there is continual need of interpreters and i suppose in a few years they will be also necessary in the assembly to tell one half of our legislators what the other half say in short unless the stream of their importation could be turned from this to other colonies as you very judiciously propose they will soon so outnumber us that all the advantages we have will not in my opinion be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious the french who watch all advantages are now themselves making a german settlement back of us in the illinois country and by means of those germans they may in time come to an understanding with ours and indeed in the last war our germans showed a general disposition that seems to bode us no good for when the english who were not quakers alarmed by the danger arising from the defenceless state of our country entered unanimously into an association within this government and the lower counties raised armed and disciplined near ten thousand men the germans except a very few in proportion to their numbers refused to engage in it giving out one among another and even in print that if they were quiet the french should they take the country would not molest them at the same time abusing the philadelphians for fitting out privateers against the enemy and representing the trouble hazard and expense of defending the province as a greater inconvenience than any that might be expected from a change of government 
yet i am not for refusing entirely to admit them into our colonies all that seems to be necessary is to distribute them more equally mix them with the english establish english schools where they are now too thickly settled and take some care to prevent the practice lately fallen into by some of the ship owners of sweeping the german gulls to make up the number of their passengers i say i am not against the admission of germans in general for they have their virtues their industry and frugality is exemplary they are excellent husbandmen and contribute greatly to the improvement of a country i pray god long to preserve to great britain the english laws manners liberties and religion notwithstanding the complaints so frequent in your public papers of the prevailing corruption and degeneracy of your people i know you have a great deal of virtue still subsisting among you and i hope the constitution is not so near a dissolution as some seem to apprehend i do not think you are generally become such slaves to your vices as to draw down that justice milton speaks of when he says that quote, sometimes nations will descend so low from reason which is virtue that no wrong but justice and some fatal curse annexed deprives them of their outward liberty their inward lost footnote paraphrased from paradise lost book twelve lines ninety seven through one o one in history we find that piety public spirit and military prowess have their flows as well as their ebbs in every nation and that the tide is never so low but it may rise again but should this dreaded fatal change happen in my time how should i even in the midst of the affliction rejoice if we have been able to preserve those invaluable treasures and can invite the good among you to come and partake of them oh let not britain seek to oppress us but like an affectionate parent endeavor to secure freedom to her children that they may be able to assist her one day in defending her own whereas a mortification begun in the foot may spread upwards to the destruction of the nobler parts of the body i fear i have already extended this rambling letter beyond your patience and therefore conclude with requesting your acceptance of the enclosed pamphlet from sir your most humble servant b franklin end of the letter from benjamin franklin to peter collinson ninth of may seventeen fifty three